Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this short game to come video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to start the video out with the Intel 8-core Coffee Lake processor. That's right, we have specifications and early leaks on the CPU's performance. Then we're going to move over to yet another series of Spectre vulnerabilities. Just to clarify, these are not Spectre Next Generation. These are entirely separate. Then we're going to finish the video with some good news. EVGA are ditching the driver disk. Instead, they're going to be putting all of their software on USB, and I want to celebrate that. Before we begin the video, I'd like to encourage you, if you do enjoy the video, to click the subscribe and the like button. And of course, leave a comment below on your thoughts of today's stories. But with that said, let's start. It's doubtless that the 8700K is a really nice processor, but there is one thing for certain. Intel are still behind, in the minds of customers anyway, in the core wars. Currently, they have 6 cores, 12 threads against the Ryzen 2700X, 8 cores, 16 threads. Of course, there are clock speeds to take into consideration, as well as IPC of single thread performance, but still. A few days ago, Intel actually released the Z390 chipset block diagram, and it showed that, yes, on the surface, the actual Z390 chipset is very similar to that of the Z370. The primary difference is inclusions such as the wireless AC adapter being baked right into the chipset, which should reduce manufacturing costs. A rather gosh darn interesting entry, however, has appeared on Sysoft Sandra's database, and this shows a leak of an 8-core, 16-thread engineering sample, let's just be honest, processor. Now, there are a couple of things for us to take into consideration. First things first, it tells us that the name of the CPU is CPU0000. This is obviously not correct, and thus is an engineering sample. It is also being identified as KB-Link. It's also running at a rather paltry clock speed. We'll get to the clock speed in just a moment. First of all, let's go for the reason it's identifying it as KB-Lake rather than Coffee Lake. Coffee Lake is essentially an evolution of KB-Lake. It's essentially KB-Lake 2.0. The primary difference, actually, of Coffee Lake is that it supports more processor cores rather than four cores, eight threads. We are, of course, looking at six cores, 12 threads. Well, now, technically, we're looking at eight cores, uh, 16 threads. The specifications for this particular chip, of course, read eight cores, 16 threads. I'm going to get to the clock speed in a second. Eight times 256 KB of level two cache, which makes sense. 256 kilobytes of level two cache is per core, just to clarify, and a grand total of 16 megabytes of level three. Now, hyperthreading is enabled on this chip, but it is listing as just 2.6 gigahertz. So there's a couple of theories that I have for this. The first is that it's an early engineering sample. Therefore, clock speed is not necessarily what they're caring about right now. It's just seeing if the darn thing works, if there's actually any errors in the logic of the processor. In other words, if you are trying to tell it, please find me the answer of 1 plus 1, it's not telling us 4. The other possibility is that Sysoft Sandra is just not particularly identifying it correctly. So, for example, it could be reading it at 2.6 GHz when it could, in fact, be running at 3.6 GHz or 4 GHz or 25 GHz. Hint, one of those is very, very unlikely. I do have some suspicions, and I'm hoping I'm wrong here, but I do have some suspicions it won't quite be running at the same clock speed as, let's say, the 8700K. After all, it does have an awful lot more cores, but then again, I have been wrong in the past, and I may be wrong here. Perhaps Intel will be able to run the CPU at identical clock speeds as the 8700K, which would be very compelling for both 8700K users to possibly upgrade, or folks who are considering the Zen architecture to then simply go with Intel instead. There are still numerous questions, and I have asked these before, but I'm just going to remind everyone that, yes, this is using an 1151-based socket. In fact, you can even see right then and there that it is, in fact, using a Cable Lake client system. But whether we're going to see backwards compatibility with the Z370 boards or whatever system you have currently is, well, a guess. 
We do know that an 8700K will work in a Z390 motherboard, but that doesn't necessarily mean that vice versa will be true. I'm curious to know your thoughts on this. Would you buy the 8800K or whatever it ends up being called? Are you going to stick with your current system? Or are you just somewhat sick of Intel and perhaps just want to go with AMD? Or are you going to do possibly the best thing of all, and that is just wait for performance numbers? Although, in a somewhat less enthusiastic piece of Intel news, there are yet more Intel Spectre vulnerabilities, and this is actually published by the former head of Intel's security. Ow. So, I'm hopefully going to pronounce this chap's name correctly. Uri Billigin has actually found new speculative execution attacks and they hinge on both Spectre Variant 1 and also possibly work with Variant 2 Spectre exploits. He has created a new security agency, Eclipsium, and the company have released a rather lengthy blog post detailing exactly what the vulnerability is, how it functions, and of course, the most important thing, what type of impact it would have in your system if you were to be affected by this. But there is some good news, and that is that Intel have already began working with this. In fact, the company, uh, Eclipsium, were working with Intel on this back in March, and they recommend the same software guidance to actually mitigate Spectre Variant 1 with its various vulnerabilities as what is found in here, also known as SMM, or System Management Mode, which are the series of vulnerabilities that Eclipsium have found. I'm going to read out a couple of the sentences of their conclusion. In our example, we demonstrated this attack scenario against an x86 system management mode and exfiltrated the data from system management RAM protected by the CPU hardware. This expands the impact aspect of vulnerabilities. Rather than just revealing secrets from another victim process, our analysis reveals that attackers can leverage SMM's access to physical memory and steal secrets from other processes hypervisors or even the firmware. Intel has indicated that existing mitigation guidance would be effective and the PSIRT team has provided helpful responses to our communications about this issue. Ultimately, vulnerabilities like this are going to become increasingly normal, I feel. And it's most likely the reason that we are seeing in NVIDIA AMD, Intel, and other companies push towards AI when it comes to the design of their processors. And of course, testing itself. Quite simply, there's a greater chance that an AI doing this type of thing would be able to find these vulnerabilities, but we're still a long way off for that to become a consistent and reliable method of testing. My advice, just for your FYI, is the normal thing, and I'm not going to tell you anything groundbreaking here. Just make sure that you have updated your motherboard uh, to the latest BIOS. Make sure, of course, that you've got any of the latest Windows updates and just down download something that is clearly something you do not trust. You can also use a Spectre Meltdown Checker to see if your system is vulnerable. And I'd highly advise everyone, of course, to make sure that their system has all of the data which is important to them backed up and or encrypted, preferably both. Okay, and now on to the last topic, EVGA, because they are ditching the driver DVD. That's right, they are switching to the USB flash drive. Ah, driver disks, they have been part of PCs as long as I can damn well remember, whether it was the five and a quarter inch floppies that I saw my friend use back way back in the day I was pretty damn young then and the three and a half inch discs all the way to of course CDs and then finally DVDs floppers have been thrown in drawers CDs have been used as frisbees particularly in the age of the internet so after all one of the things you're going to immediately do is simply update your drivers to the latest version this is particularly true now when a lot of system builders don't even put DVD drives or something in their system. But drivers and the software that goes on disks is now becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And by the time you add all of the software up, you start noticing that your drive is now 5, 6, 7, 8 gigabytes in just drivers and other utilities. 
And the other problem, of course, is by the time six or seven or eight months has passed, certainly a year has passed, all of the software has been outdated, which means that you've got a couple of choices. The first choice is that you will simply not use that disk because you're just going to use another system if you really need to. For example, let's say that your network card or something like that requires a driver because Windows doesn't detect it automatically, then possibly at best you would use a USB drive to plug, plop into your system, install the network card, and then from there you would simply go online, download all of the drivers, and that's about it. So, what are EVGA doing about this? Well, the Global Product Management Director, Jacob Freeman, has decided that all EVA EVGA motherboards, excuse me, will no longer come with driver discs. Instead, they will come with a USB flash and they will come with all of the drivers and software on an 80 gigabyte drive. Now, of course, they're not the first company to do this. In fact, Asus have done it way back in the day, uh, but those are for high-end boards. EVGA are going to be doing this with their entire lineup. And according to Jacob, the cost of this is about 20 times that of a DVD. So despite the fact it is an 8GB USB 2 drive, they are trying to set the standard here. Honestly though, USB 2.0 is absolutely fine for installing files. And quite frankly, I love the fact that they're doing this because that means that this USB stick is going to be updatable. If you so desire, you can simply delete the old drivers and of course, make note that yes, you have updated them to the latest version on this particular stick. And eventually, if you were to, let's say, throw away the motherboard or upgrade it, you can still use this USB stick for something else. To me, no, of course, this is not as exciting as a high-end graphics card or a new platform launch. But you know what? I'm bloody glad of this because ultimately, I never use DVDs anymore. They're just a pain in the butt. I just don't even have an optical drive installed in my system. I'm just going to be honest. Yes, that's my choice. Yes, I could resolve that. Hell, I could use a USB DVD drive if I really wanted to, but I just don't because ultimately I'm just going to download the latest version of the drivers anyway. So I kind of like this. It is just one of those nice little touches. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. Normal stuff like, share, comment, subscribe. Have a great day though. I'll see you soon and take care of yourselves. Bye for now.